I remember. So chapter three, if you remember, is uh, when he gets that scroll, he's told to eat it, right? And then God tells him, you're going to go speak to Israel, but they're not going to listen to you. Don't go to anybody else. They will listen to you, but don't go to them. Which is kind of a fun command, isn't it? Like, discouraging, right? It's like, oh, it'd be like telling the pastor, we're going to set you in this place, they're going to hate you, and they're going to want to kill you. But that's who you're sent to, and that's who you're supposed to preach to. Oh, and say the words that they're not going to like either. Okay, then. Right? But that's part of the job. Uh, Ezekiel, in particular, for a long time, could be given to do that. And you remember that the Spirit lifted him up. There was the seven days. Okay, then we were talking about the watchman part, right? So that was 17 through 18, where he says, Son of man, I made you a watchman for the house of Israel. Whenever you hear a word from my mouth, you shall give them warning from me. Right? So he's watching for the people, but according to the word that's given to him by the Lord. So he's not supposed to make up things or scare them about things that God hasn't actually said. All right. And then we have these three, I think there were three cases. Yeah. Three different cases of like how he could go wrong, basically. All right. So the first case, which I think we talked about, was you shall surely die. If you say to the wicked, you shall surely die, and you give him no warning. Or if I say to the wicked, you shall surely die, and you give him no warning, nor speak to warn the wicked from his wicked way in order to save his life. The wicked person still dies for his iniquity. That's true no matter what, right? Unless he's forgiven. But his blood I will require for your hand. So for your failure to warn the one who's in their, in their sin, you also will end up bearing your sin and die. That's pretty strong. Jesus used the same language for, for the apostles and for the apostolic ministry. You know, it would be better for you to have a millstone tied about your own neck and be thrown into the depth of the sea than to cause one of these little ones in the land of sin. Right. That same language of little one that we heard in the parable today. Although I'm not really sure if the parable that's another story. Maybe anal analogical or metaphorical. Alright, so first case. Um, second case, but I think it's the second case. Yeah, but if you warn the wicked, verse 19, and he does not turn from his wickedness or from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, same as before, but you have delivered your soul. So you be faithful, regardless of whether it does anything for the person that you're preaching to. Making sense so far? All right. And then the third case is, again, if a righteous person turns from his righteousness and commits injustice, and I lay a stumbling block before him, he shall die, because you have not warned him, he shall die for his sin, and his righteous deeds that he has done shall not be remembered. But again, like with case A, but his blood, or case one, I will require your hand. All right. Actually, there's four cases then. And then verse 21 is the fourth case. But if you warn the righteous person not to sin, and he does not sin, he shall surely live, because he took warning, and you will not deliver your soul. Right? So that the fourth case is the case that I hope that I'm usually in. <laughs> I'm speaking to people who are believers, and I warn them of what, what could lead them astray, and they repent of the things that are driving them astray, and we all live <laughs> in righteousness, in Christ's righteousness. That's what it is. By the way, righteousness, uh, we didn't define it, but we did during the daily prayer for the week with Abraham, right? last couple of weeks, actually. It means to believe in Christ for the forgiveness of sins. That's what it means. So it's Christ's righteousness that saves you, not yours. Yeah. And Jesus is being pretty tricky today, right? With this. Like, yeah, he was saying everything you wanted to hear about good works. But, he was, but you have to pay attention to the little bit. At least these my brethren. They didn't even know. It's like, well then, okay. We can't take credit. We don't even recognize our good works then it's really not about good works, is it? Right. That's, one of the, that's a hard parable. All right, of course All right, so there's the four cases. In that, in the middle of the, the back of uh, the handout from last time, which was two weeks ago, I guess, huh? Um, wicked man and righteous man are key terms. And I don't know if we did this, but I think we should have reviewed this. Frequent in the Psalms and in uh, wisdom. So, think. Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, even maybe Lamentations to some degree. Uh, uh, Job as well. And often used antithetically. So there's the wicked man and the righteous man. Or today, the sheep and the guys. Right? Okay. They are not to be heard as behavioral, moralistic terms. 
Right? So that's usually what people think. Wicked means they do wicked things. Righteous means they do righteous things. I said that in sort of, right? It's wrong, but that's why you know, I said that. Throw it off a bit. So, but they are covenantal forensic in regards to justification. And if you don't believe me, uh, you can go read all the proof from our Lutheran Confessions. Article Confession, Article 4, Article 6, Apology, Article 4. That'll take you all Saturday. You'll get through it. You got a free time today, you can go do that. Uh, covenantal, meaning they're, to be righteous is to be attached to God's promise. To be in God's promise, if you like. Forensic, meaning it's by God's declaration. Not by your doing, but by his declaring. Forensic, like a, like a, what do you mean? Forensics was like debate club, right? Yeah. yeah, so it's people standing up and talking at you. <laughs> this is God saying, you are righteous, right? And in regards to justification, for the sake of Christ, by his shed blood, for the forgiveness of sins. That's what makes one righteous. Right? A wicked man is someone who has been found guilty and convicted before God in his heavenly court. He may outwardly be part of the covenant community, right? So you think, um, he goes to church, etc., right? But his heart is elsewhere. Right. Or his moral or religious behavior may betray his unbelief. So while we can't distinguish sheep and goats, right, you're that sermon. Um, if I see people behaving in, in goat ways, according to the pastoral ministry, I'm just to judge them according to the word, but not not eternally, just simply say, you know that's contrary to God's word, right? Right? So repent, be forgiven. It doesn't change their eternal faith necessarily. It doesn't say anything about that. It's just speaking in the moment, right? But it may be evidence, actually, about belief, right? And so their reaction may actually bear, bear witness to that. Um, by the way, um, the other problem with belief and unbelief, or sheep and goat language, is that it's not actually final until it's final, right? So the idea that no, that's people, like, once they're a goat, they can never not be a goat, be a sheep again, that's not really true, or the either, is it? Otherwise, why would you go preach to people who who don't believe because they can't repent. Right. So. There's all sorts of flaws in the way that that story is usually told. All right, but the righteous man is saved by faith alone, blameless in the forgiveness of sins. That's what makes him right. He too may outwardly, may be outwardly flagrantly lawless, oops, but yet freely confess and seek God's forgiveness. That's David, Psalm 51, right? He's killed his soldier, took his wife, bore a child by her, lied about it to everybody, including to God's priest, right? And yet he confesses and is forgiven, Psalm 51, or Psalm 32. Um, and make use of the means of the Spirit prescribed by the Jews. So that's Old Testament. Because remember, we're in the Old Testament here. So means of the Spirit in the Old Testament, of course, are all the sacrifices to which God has attached his word of promise. But as we heard in the Psalm today, Psalm... Uh, what was it? Nine or nine? No, that was when I was reading this song. Psalm fifty. Psalm fifty. Yes, it's Psalm fifty today. Does he desire the, the blood of bulls and goats? If, you, if I were hungry, would I tell you? Because all that happens in the earth, all the earth is mine, right? So, what's the point of the sacrifice of the blood and the, uh, and the blood of the bulls and the goats? He actually tells you in the psalm. Do you remember? It was the antiphon, right? Follow me in the day of trouble, and I will deliver you. Right? It's about faith. Those are to point to the need for atonement, for, for forgiveness. That's why they were prescribed. So, means, so, you could go to the temple and do all the prescribed sacrifices and not believe any of it, right? But at, while on the same token, you could go and do the prescribed sacrifices, hear the word that the priest would, would proclaim in the midst of your sacrifice, whether Whatever prescribed sacrifice it is, bull, goat, the bread, um, so that's the grain offering. I don't know, but they're all different offerings, right? Um, and hear that word in faith and receive it in faith. And so they were just as much a means of spirit as today, baptism, Lord's Supper, and preaching um, provide the spirit because they had God's promise attached to them. So that's what would have happened in the Old Testament. Uh, wicked and righteous, then are theological, not legalistic, moralistic terms. And that's it's founded, actually, in Ezekiel 18 and Ezekiel 33. So we'll get to that eventually. Or, if you prefer, just read Paul in Romans 1, chapter 1 through chapter 8, right, which is foundational for everything that we're talking about.
all, all brings it all together. Everything that Jesus taught and all everything the prophets taught brings it all together um, and shows that it's a whole. Okay. So both also point to an eternal reality. So they're eschatological, I know you love that word, end time stuff, right? So the righteous receiving resurrection and eternal life and the wicked eternal punishment. Uh, we heard that today, right? Or you could go look at Isaiah 65, Job 19, that's resurrection, Daniel 12, also resurrection. So the, those terms, you have to keep those in mind, because you know, I don't think anybody hears them that way. They all think wicked or wicked, wicked does, right? Wicked people do wicked things or think wicked things, right? And righteous people do righteous things. And it's probably worse this time of year, because you've got Mr. Santa Claus, right? <laughs> and that, I mean, that's straight up Santa Claus theology, as I call it, right? You do good things, you get good presents. That's right. And that is the way of the world. It's the way of the flesh. It's what we actually want. We want the bad people to get the bad things. And we want us, who are good people, right, to do good things. It doesn't quite work out that way. Mr. Uh, Sam uh, Brickman Freed, or whatever his name was, you know, FDX, Crypto Exchange, you know, call it. Oh, yeah. 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 I mean, like, bankrupt everybody. And then somehow he's going to manage probably to skate out with you know, millions of dollars. Yeah. Although I guess he he sent his plane to Argentina, but he was still holed up in, in Bahamas in his $20 million mansion or apartment. So and now, now the feds have him surrounded. So that's going to go well. Kids these days. <laughs> yeah. yeah, can you imagine? He's, he's 29, he's managing hundreds of billions of dollars worth of funds. His girlfriend, who looks like she's like 12, was managing the philanthropic arm. Um, and she she embezzled through him. It's also like $10 million a year. Just, dang. These are all Ivy League scholar children. Yeah. <laughs> her, her dad teaches at MIT. You know, he went to the, the fourth went to MIT with Sam Guy. And then, yeah, this is a crazy story. It's going to be worse than Enron, actually. And the fallout you'll see on Monday morning when the market opens. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Because how many people are tied up in that? Mm-hmm. We'll find out pretty quick. Robin had the trade platform will be dead. Mm-hmm. It'll drop on them. They're done. So, you remember Enron, right? Mm-hmm. Do you remember any of the details about it? No, they just sweep under the rug. That's a big deal, a lot of money, we'll bail them out. So, move on. Right? We do another bailout. The dollars today, that's probably not going to go All right, so now we can turn to the sheet. Um, yeah, I don't we won't get too far on it today because I don't know, for some reason, everything went wrong in church. It's okay, we'll read it, we'll talk a little bit about it, and then uh, we'll come back to it. We'll talk a little bit more about it. As we do, right? So, chapter four. Oh, before we do that, the last verse here. Uh, chapter 3. But when I speak with you, I will open your mouth, and you shall say to them, Thus says the Lord God. He who will hear, let him hear, and he who will refuse to hear, let him refuse, for they are of God's house. Right? So that's kind of encouraging for Ezekiel. Right? I'm going to open your mouth, and give you the words to say, to say them, and everything else is on them. Or on me, really. It's on God. Either convert or not. Alright, then it gets fun. So, let's read. I'm going to talk about it. And you, son of man, <laughs> son of man, take a brick and lay it before you, and engrave it, engrave on it a city, even Jerusalem, and put siege works against it, and build a siege wall against it, and cast up a mountain against it, set camps also against it, and plant battering rams against it all around. And you take an iron griddle and place it as an iron wall between you and the city. And set your face toward it, and let it be in a state of siege, and press the siege against it. This is a sign for the house of Israel. Then lie on your left side, and place the punishment of the house of Israel upon it. For the number of the days that you lie on it, you shall bear your punishment. For I assign to you a number of days, 390 days, equal to the number of the years of their punishment. So long shall you bear the punishment of the house of Israel. And when you have completed these, you shall lie down a second time, but on your right side, and bear the punishment of the house of Judah. Right, let me scroll here. Yeah. 
Right, right at the top line, 40 days. 40 days, I assign you a day for each year. And you shall set your face toward the siege of Jerusalem with your arm bare, and you shall prophesy against the city. Like that. And behold, I will place cords upon you so that you cannot turn from one side to the other till you have completed the days of your siege. All right. Keep on. And you take wheat and barley, beans and lentils, millet and emmer, and put them into a single vessel and make your bread from them. During the number of days that you lie on your side, 390 days, you shall eat it. And your food that you eat shall be by weight, 20 shekels a day, a day. From day to day, you shall eat it. And water you shall drink by measure, the sixth part of a pin. From day to day you shall drink, and you shall eat it as a barley cake, baking it in their sight on human dung. And the Lord said, Thus shall the people of Israel eat their bread unclean among the nations where I will drive them. Then I say, Ah, Lord God, behold, I have never defiled myself. From my youth up till now I have never eaten what died of itself or was torn by beasts. Hmm. nor has tainted meat come into my mouth. Then he said to me, See, I assign to you cow's dung instead of human dung. Yeah, nice bargain. On which you may prepare your bread. Moreover, he said to me, Son of man, behold, I will break the supply of bread in Jerusalem. They shall eat bread by weight and with anxiety, and they shall drink water by measure and in dismay. I will do this that they may lack bread and water and look at one another in dismay and rot away because of their punishment. Mm. That's pretty harsh, huh? Mm. Yeah. All right. I was using ESV. I don't know if it's better or worse. Uh, let's see if it translates those. 20 shekels and sixth of a hen, whatever a hen is. All right. This is the source of the famous Ezekiel bread. You guys know about that? It's a popular staple at the health sprout. food store. Well, it's not just sprouted. Isn't it just sprout? No, it's got it's got beans and lentils in it. They grind, they dry them out, and they grind them up as a powder, and they put it in there. Uh, if you actually try to make it according to probably what he's making here, it's not edible. <laughs> and it's here's the thing about the Ezekiel bread is they're like, oh, it's Ezekiel's diet, so the prophet ate it, so it must be good. Well, you could use the same thing. John the Baptist ate locusts and wild honey, so why don't you do that? Right? This is a bread of judgment. It's a terrible bread. They don't even they can't even put together like a wheat or a barley loaf. They have to mix everything together. There's, this is the uh, what do we call it when you have all the leftovers and you just throw it all together? Mishmash. The mishmash. Yeah, this is mishmash bread. It's not supposed to be good. It's not a prescription. It's not a sandwich. Yeah. Well, okay. Well, that but there's two different loaves, right? So that, that may have not been immediately clear. So there was the. Right, but then there are 12, it's the barley cakes that you use the human waste. Yeah, so and that actually, we don't actually, we can talk about that, we don't actually know. Um, there, there must be some kind of like oral tradition about, you know, that would be, it's just gross, really. Right, but maybe, um, maybe there's also some kind of like new pseudo -Le uh, Levitical prescription. Because remember, Ezekiel was trained as a priest, never got to serve as priest. He'll be a priest slash prophet here. He'll kind of do both things. But uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know. And, it, and doing it over cow dung, that's not going to be much better. All right. But that's what, they're, what, what this is all talking about. And maybe this is a helpful way to think about it. I mean, especially this first part, which is kind of fun. If you're, are, any of you do like model railroad or build like model airplanes or used to, <laughs> used to yeah i mean that because that's what he's doing right he's got the little brick and he carves the city of jerusalem into it and he sets up all the little miniature seeds walls he probably probably got the you know the paints and he was painting them right if he had a 3d printer he could print all the parts in his 3d printer <laughs> right is he's what are you saying warhammer yeah yeah like warhammer okay um that's what it sounds like but here's there's different kinds of prophecy so this, this form of prophecy is not, um, it maybe not as common, but it's not as well known to us, is that sometimes God will have the prophet do things as a testimony with no words or very few words. So they're going to watch Ezekiel. They know who he is. He's a prophet. 
He's God's prophet. And he's out there laying on his left side for 390 days. Every day he goes out there and he lays on his side and he's looking at the little model of Jerusalem that he set up. <laughs> right? And, he's, and he eats only a 20 shekels, so just a little portion of that loaf. So it's going to get stale too. It's going to be terrible. Right? Maybe it makes more. Who knows? Right? And just a little bit of water and he just lays there and he's just... And they're like, what's wrong with the prophet? Imagine like 390 days, you're talking a year, right? And he's just like, what... What is wrong with that guy? Right? But it would, it would probably get on their nerves after a while. It's like he won't speak to us. But he keeps staring at this, you know, at this model of Jerusalem. Yeah. So you call that an action prophecy, you'd say. Right? Now, of course, there's going to be words attached to it as well, but but it starts out with this action. You know, his actions are a testimony against them. Um, sackcloth and ashes are kind of like that. Right? It's as a sign of repentance. Like, you don't have to ask somebody, like, are you upset or sorrowful? Because you're in sackcloth and ashes. Or, I mean, today, somebody dressed in, like, black, especially if they have a black veil, you'd be like, I know that you're either coming to or going from a funeral. Right? Right? So your actions are actually a testimony. You don't even have to use words. Right? Or you could even see that sometimes on people's faces, I suppose. Right? You can just see in their face that you know something's wrong. Right? So, so that's what Ezekiel is doing. Uh, what did I write? Ezekiel mimics in miniature and detail the regular course of the siege of an ancient walled city. Uh, but there is something weird. There's this verse 3, Moreover, take for yourself an iron plate and set it as an iron wall between you and the city. All right, so that's something new. Because normally you wouldn't set up your little siege towers and your mound, right, and all the people. And then, you know, you play with your little figures, right? But what's happening here is that then he also sets up a wall of separation between the city and and Ezekiel, so Ezekiel being actually God's representative, he's testifying that there's a wall. God's, God's actually, they've set themselves against God, and so he's, he's just watching. He's going to watch the whole destruction of Jerusalem. Just stand back and watch. Right? Allow, that, allow that to happen to them. All right? so, and then, of course, once he starts talking, they're gonna, he's, it's a hostile word. Um, there's something interesting through this chapter and then the next chapter. Um, they keep referring, talking about a sign, right? This language of sign or portent, like as an important, but this is just portent. Where, uh, where was that? Yeah, verse 3. This will be a sign to the house of Israel. We love that language of sign because we use that now, right? You know, what are, I ask the kids, you know, how do you know that Jesus loves you, right? They're like, I feel it in my heart. I'm like, no. How do you know? In other words, what I'm asking is, what's the sign? What's the visible? How has God attached his promise to a sign so that you know? I was like, oh, I'm baptized. Yes, exactly. Right? So same thing here. Ezekiel is a sign of God's judgment against them. They can look to him, and even without the word of judgment, they know what's happening. All right? um, type is another thing. Um, Paul puts these two together, in particular, in Galatians. Right, where there's the sign of the thing, but there's also types of things. And it comes from tupos in Greek. You don't have to understand that. Um, but types are something different than just a sign. So they're, uh, they're like prophetic figures of things that are to come. They can be a place. So like Sodom and Gomorrah is a type of the judgment on the last day. Right? Fire and brimstone. Everything's wiped out. Done. Why? Because of unbelief, too. Right? Same reason. All right. Um, what would be another example of this? So that's a place. Uh, institutions? Oh, that would be an interesting one. I mean, David's kingdom is used as a positive example of the, of the future kingdom. Right? Christ's kingdom. So David's lesser and Christ is greater. But it's still, you know, like a son like you and who will reign forever, though. Right? Unlike your kingdom, which will be brought to an end. All right. So, so that's another, it's kind of like a sign, but it's, they're not interchangeable. All right. So sign is like, here's a, here's a visible thing and here's a word, a promise or curse attached to it versus a type, which is like a foreshadowing or pro prophetic kind of thing. Anyway, so you'll see some of those. And that's important because we're going to talk about these numbers maybe. Well, I don't know if you want to talk about that or you want to talk about the bread. What did I write? One of the most challenging sections of the book to interpret. All right, so why don't we try? <laughs> All right, so he lies on his left side, and there's Israel, and then on his right side, and that's Judah, right? So that's, I think that's pretty clear what's going on there. you got the two kingdoms, right? 
The northern kingdom is judged first, was judged first. It's already been actually in exile. It was taken into exile by the Assyrians. Right? Remember now we're, uh, we're in 580, what year are we? 586 or something? Uh, what did I write? I think I put it down in here. 593, Ezekiel's call, 593. No, yes. Yeah, 593, good. Um, so we're, we're in Babylon at this point. Uh, when he's prophesying, right? So it's been a while since Israel had been taken into captivity. Uh, but if you go back 390 years, that puts you where? And David's reign. Hmm. The second half of David's reign goes pretty poorly. So that would, that would make sense. David started to a pop. I mean, he married all these foreign wives, right? And then his son Solomon, even worse. So it's kind of the beginning of the collapse of both Judah and Israel, because Solomon's son split the kingdom, right? Well, kind of son. Um, so maybe that's what's going on there. Who knows? <laughs> this is the problem with these numbers, right? It's like, well, I don't know. Maybe. 40. That one's even harder. So if you go back 40, you literally from 593, you get to Josiah. Josiah's a good figure. If Judah, because Josiah brought some reformation to the worship life, um, so he restored the temple, but he didn't tear down the high places. So it's not exactly a super faithful king. As long as he was with the prophet, it said he was faithful. So I don't know if that's helpful. 40 years, though, you know, 40 all over the place, right? Especially the exile um, in the wilderness between Egypt and the promised land. So that probably has something more in mind, maybe. By the way, the Greek Old Testament has different figures. 150 and 40. I don't know what that, why, but who knows? Who knows? So that, then that makes us question, because the Greek Old Testament is older than the Hebrew New Test, copy of the Old Testament. So maybe the Greek is actually accurate and the Hebrew is wrong. Who knows? All right. But I like the idea of, this is at the very end of that third paragraph. Uh, there's a document called the Damascus document, which was referred to by... Mm, some first century uh, church father. I can't remember which one or second century, but we didn't have it. And then they found copies at Qumran. So this document that had been referred to, and it was just kind of part of tradition, but they didn't actually have a copy of it. Then uh, it was found in, in the caves at Qumran, you know, the Dead Sea Scrolls, just fragments of it, but enough to confirm that what was the tradition and that the, 390 and the 430 years were referring to um, the Egyptian exile and then also prophetic of the final judgment. So, because uh, you remember, Paul uses this in Galatians as well, where he talks about how, you know, the, the time, it was about 400 years from when Abram received, or when they, when they left for Egypt and when they were finally delivered into the promised land. Uh, actually, it was 430 years, so there's different numbers. So 390 and 430, if you put 390 and 40 together. So anyway, the, the ancient Christians thought, primarily thought of this as a type of the Last Judgment and parallel not to Israel and Judah kingdoms, but actually to Egypt and the Egyptian, um, the, the bondage and slavery in Egypt for 400 years. So there you go. But either way, he's going to lay on his side, left side for 390 days. He's going to lay on his other side for on his right side for forty days. All right. Uh, there's something else that's interesting in that. Verse four. Notice what he says. Uh, lie also on your left side and lay the iniquity of the house of Israel upon it. So he's he's going to be planking on his left, <laughs> and and God's going to put the iniquity on him. Or he says, God, take that iniquity, their their sin upon you. That's also kind of challenging, right? But there you have the prophet, just like uh, with Moses, this happens um, with others. The prophet bears the iniquity of the people. Like he has, not only does he have to bear with them because they're idiots. Sorry, I didn't mean to point at you, Don. Uh, I should have pointed, should have pointed at my children. Not only does he have to bear with them because they, they won't listen to God's word, um, but he also has to, he bears their sin, right? Because he's constantly bringing their sin to remembrance for the sake of forgiveness. But so you have to bear with that. And also, you know, you know this with pastors. I mean, we hear confession. People confess their sins to be forgiven. 
But in a sense, thankfully, my, my brain doesn't work very well. So I don't remember most, most things people tell me, not for very long. Even the scandalous things, I, mean, I just forget. I don't even remember what show I, you know, what happened in the show I watched yesterday, right? I didn't watch the show yesterday. I was at the auction. Something happened at the auction. I don't remember. So, so I, maybe I'm well suited for pastoral ministry since I just forget everything. But, um, but in a sense, you also don't, right? I mean, you're bearing that. You're not bearing it on your own conscience, but especially if you're sympathetic and there's care and concern for the person, then you're you're going to hold that with them. Or even if they're just sick or you know in need, you know. But here it's specifically iniquity, right? So I said, instead of Yahweh representing Israel, now the prophet acts as priest, and that way typifying Jesus Christ, right? So now Ezekiel, as I said, is a type of Jesus because the sin is put on him, right? And it's weighing him down. Iniquity can mean any number of things. I give you some examples here. It could be a single thing, single action. It could be the whole human condition, what we call original sin. It can be the guilt that results from our behavior, immoral behavior. It can be the divine punishment as a result of sin. It could be iniquity. Or it can be actually God-bearing of sin in himself. That's what the scapegoat. So in here, the high priest also, if you read Leviticus and, and Exodus, the high priest bears the iniquity of the people, and he actually bears it on his head. And that's what the whole head thing is representing, is God has put the sin of the people on his head, and then he makes the sacrifice for that to be removed. And there's all sorts of pictures or signs of these things. Um, of course, he's bearing their sin. That doesn't mean he's forgiving it, but he's carrying it, if you like. Uh, atonement comes in Christ alone. So that's interesting, too, I think. All right. Questions so far? Yeah. I mean, this is always the problem. You see this with Revelation, too. The numbers can mean any number of things. So you just kind of let them be. Uh, certainly, I mean, if anything, Israel has been apostated, has apostated, has departed from the faith much longer than Judah has at this point. And, and it's roughly is about 40 years since Judah. Um, so there you go. All right. Uh, Therefore, you shall set your face toward the siege of Jerusalem. Not the actual Jerusalem, but the little model figurine Jerusalem that he set up. <laughs> this is kind of fun, right? Your arms shall be uncovered. So he's supposed to lay there and, and you shall prophesy against it. So not only is the crazy prophet laying on his side in front of a little model of Jerusalem, but he's going to start speaking at it. Can you imagine? I think they should. I don't. And surely I will restrain you. All right. So here's God saying, I'm going to put cords on you or bind you so that you can't turn away until you've done it. So you don't have any choice about this. This is your job. As crazy as it looks, you know, it is just what it is. And if that isn't weird enough, then here's what you're supposed to eat. Yeah. So wheat, barley, that's all fine. You can mix wheat and barley. It'd be kind of a nice two-grain bread, right? But then beans, millet, and spelt in this translation, which are, I millet, you can use in bread, right? Spelt, you can too, right? Whatever that is. I don't know if that's a good translation. I guess it is. It's a type of wheat. Uh, but not beans and lentils. You don't put beans and lentils in your bread. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, yeah, when you're lying on the so left side, you eat that. And it even tells you how much, right? And then the barley cakes are, I think, for the right side. I think that's how you would rightly understand that. Welcome. And bake it as fuel, or bake it using the fuel of the human waste. Aye. Right, so now that's, that's clearly, like, like you said, it's gross. Maybe there's some tradition about not doing this. But it's also, um, you know, it's vulgar, right? This is not, and in, in that way, it's meant to be a testimony, again, against the people, right? And this actually is, when you're under siege, this is the kind of thing that happens, right? You have to combine ingredients. You don't have fuel. You don't have wood for fire because you're, you're surrounded. You're under siege. So, yes, of course, you're going to burn dung to bake things or to cook things, right? Um, but it's still gross, right? And... There's, like I said, there's some kind of tradition because Ezekiel says, this is the only time, actually in the entire book, this is the only time he says to God, no, I can't do that. All right, it's right here in chapter four. Ah, Lord God, indeed, I have never defiled myself from my youth till now. I've never eaten what died of itself, right? So that was prohibited in, there's all the texts you can see, Exodus 22, Leviticus 17, Leviticus 22, Ezekiel 44, or was torn by beasts. That seems to be... Um, an interpretation, and then also abominable flesh, so that's prohibited meats. 
has ever come into my mouth. So he's suggesting that by doing this, he's eating something that would defile him as priest. And he pushes back. And like I said, it's the only time he does that. Um, and, but, the, but God actually gives him this accommodation here, right? I'll give you cow dung instead of human waste. All right, well, that's a little bit better, I guess. I don't know. Part of what's the problem with this kind of story, I mean, you said it's gross. Uh, uh, what I heard one psychologist, I think we talked about this before, refer to something called the yuck factor. Have you heard this before? It's just trying to just describe uh, the kind of response that we would say theologically, the response of, of the law written on our hearts to things that are contrary to it, right? So seeing two men behaving as if they were married, for example, should get, there should be a sense of disgust, naturally, according to our heart. Of course, you can change these things, right? You can mute and you can set it aside. And then the way you mute and set aside, of course, is by doing it or being a part of it. Then the, then the yuck is kind of diminished, right? Because you get acclimated to it. But now you're living a lie. And we're pretty good at that, though. Um, there's lots of things that should cause us to just be disgusted, and we're not, which begs the question, then why, right? And that, again, it's that acclamation, I think, but it's also participation in it is one of the ways that these things happen, um, which make it difficult for us. So, uh, you know, as Christians, we are set apart uh, from the world. I've been thinking about different ways to confess this, but um, I, I like, I've been on, on this, at least politically speaking, you know, that we are like foreign dignitaries um, living in a strange land, right? Like we believe and know of a better way, a better lordship, a better kingdom, you know, that's that's ruled not by, uh, by the tooth and claw, but ruled by uh, grace and mercy and peace in Christ Jesus, right? And we want to tell the world to do it, but we know that they're, they're not going to do it, right? You know what I mean? And so, well, so we will be, and we should be, disgusted by things that the people around us will think are perfectly normal. You know, and that, I mean, that makes it hard for us because the question then, it always begs the question, was well, there something wrong with us or is there something wrong with them? And we don't want to say something's wrong with them because that's intolerant. <laughs> but intolerant is just another word for setting aside what we know is wrong. Right? You're not supposed to tolerate evil. You don't tolerate evil. You call it what it is. That doesn't mean you can't like bear with it. You might have to bear the evil of, especially family or friends, people that you can't really set aside. So I did mention about this at the end of the bottom of the first page, right? Modern Westerners have all but lost the sense of what is clean or holy, set apart by God, partly due to the invalidation, I would suggest, of the Old Testament ceremonial laws. So if you have Jewish friends who are, who are faithful to, to the Old Testament, you will get a much better sense of this, right? Because, you know, even just like a Sabbath, like they don't, how much work they won't do and, you know, the things they won't do, right? Uh, and remember, all food is good for us. You just pray over it now. So that's part of the reason we have a problem. It's like, we can eat anything. We can eat locusts and wild honey. Why not, right? Uh, I think there's a lot of bad pathogens on locusts. It's my understanding. Yeah, but the bug, the bug thing, it's like, it, they're like, they're bug magnets. Bugs are bugs magnets? Ah, whatever. I don't know. Like, how do they, they must chemically wash them or something. <laughs> Um, and, but then also remember that we're not just talking about hygienic stuff. I mean, obviously, cooking over dung is not very hygienic. <laughs> you know, there's going to be flies and all sorts of stuff. But, um, but it, it really has to do with idolatrous practices. So to do things that are unclean or to do things that are contrary to what God has explicitly stated, right? And so you have, you have unclean lands, which are places where unbelief is practiced openly, right? I think our land is unclean. Maybe not your home or your, you know, your property, but our country. It is, we, we are defiling our country through the practices. I mean, if you've ever been in like a, a pagan temple, like Planned Parenthood, for example, uh, it, 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 if you're a Christian, it's palpably evil. But you know that this place has is, is been defiled, right? So I think we still could have some of that. Um, what else would be? There's other examples of this. Nations can be defiled in the Bible. I'm just quoting the Bible there. Cornfields, Cornfields yeah. Well, right. That's true. Right. Um, 
I mean, I would, we were going to talk about this last night and then I had to do something else, but the, um, the way that we've turned soil into dirt, we've taken out everything that is living and then we, we have to import just chemical to make it work as for crops. It's predictable that way, you know, in a lot of ways, but, it, and there's less weeds maybe, right? So maybe the harvest is easier, but now, now the ground is literally dead. It's dead and it won't work unless you actually import what's needed for life rather than being actually soil where it's, bi it's biomass, right? I, I heard that the, like the prairies before, um, before deforestation and, you know, over, you know, like Dust Bowl era stuff. Well, Dust Bowl is a great example of that, right? That's what happened. So that, that the biomass layer was three feet deep in the prairies. Can you imagine? Like it's living three feet down, you know, with worms and all the stuff, right? You know this with gardening, some of you, right? Yeah. So that's another way, yeah, to be, make something unclean or defile it is to simply, you know, I don't know if it's just applying the pesticide. Because nitrogen is technically natural, I guess. If it comes, comes from natural gas process, it came out of the ground. <laughs> you have to stretch it a little bit. All right. Uh, let's see how we're doing. Oh, we're, we're almost done. Um, so if any of this make, doesn't make sense to you, verses 16 and 17 really are the key. All right, so we can end on this. 16 and 17. All right, you're saying, well, this is Ezekiel. He's laying on his side. There's a little miniature Jerusalem. He's eating this bread that's terrible. And it's and barley bread that's baked over dung. And it's like, what does all this mean? Well, moreover, he said to me, son of man, surely I will cut off the supply of bread in Jerusalem. So your terrible bread is a sign of the terrible bread Jerusalem will have when, they, when they're put under siege. They shall eat bread by weight and with anxiety, right? So they're going to have to ration it by weight, ration it out. And wondering if there's going to be more bread tomorrow. Uh, and they shall drink water by measure and with dread. This might be their last drink, right? That they may lack bread and water and be dismayed with one another and waste away because of their iniquity. So there, God's specifically saying, you're prophesying this action prophecy. Your actions are prophesying what's going to happen to Jerusalem. And it's because of their iniquity, right? And they're not, obviously, nobody wants to hear any of this, but God does warn them. Uh, of course, he's warning them by Ezekiel, who's in Babylon, and they're in Judah, so, <laughs> you know. Uh, anyway, it will come eventually. Well, that's chapter four. What, did we miss anything? Yeah, well, there's more stuff on the back of the sheet you can read about, but that's, that's fine. Uh, I think you have to, what did I write in that last paragraph? Yeah, both the Old and New Covenants must be read Christologically, meaning Jesus does say all Scripture testifies of him. So now you want to think about this, even this strange thing about miniatures and bread and weird bread and poop as testifying of Christ. Well, how? Um, all blessings and the curses are to be understood by the cross. Galatians 3. All the covenant curses were executed in full on Christ. So this judgment that Ezekiel is pro proclaiming against Jerusalem will ultimately be meted out on Jesus himself, who will have neither water nor bread to eat at all, right, um, as he's dying, uh, who was cursed vicariously for the sins of all humanity. That's one of the hardest things to hear, that he became sin for us. He who knew no sin became sin for us. The curse that we deserved, God put on his own son. But that's what it means to be vicarious. Um, and so the cross is the heart and climax of both covenants, Old Testament and New Testament covenant. And then we only receive the benefit through faith. And by the way, these are all last time things too. So it's appropriate for this time of year. I didn't plan it that way. But one of the things that we want to remember is that Christ has already suffered the, last, the judgment of the last day for us too. So that when he comes to judge on the last day, he will say, well done, good and faithful servant, referring to himself, right? The father will say that of him and say, these people are saved because of what you did for them, not because of them. That was true at the cross. It's still true into eternity. Mm. So this is a hard thing. So you don't have to save yourself because you're already saved. We well, believe that, right? But even from the judgment and the fire and all of this, eh, they can have all these wars and rumors of wars. They can kill you, whatever. Like St. Stephen, I saw heaven open and Christ sitting at the right hand of God, right? And then he died in peace, being stoned, <laughs> which is I mean, that's faith, right? Yeah, I'm, I am Christ. I'm just like, you can do what you want to me, whatever. 
So, so there's that aspect too, and that's I think that's encouraging for Ezekiel. Maybe um, he'll get to, he'll get there eventually in chapter forty. <laughs> All right, uh, but it's going to be rough going here for a while. So I'll try to always try to bring in a little bit of Jesus if I can, even as he's eating ter- terrible stale bread on, baked on poop. That's a great way to end. You can buy it. We're talking about Ezekiel bread. You can buy the Ezekiel bread. I they follow the, they make meal out of the beans and lentils and they put it in it. They do the whole thing.